Hello everyone and thank you for joining me today. We're here because you found this video as linked for you in the main lecture related to structural properties of material. I want to thank you so much for being here. You could have been anywhere else and you've chosen to be here to watch this video. I'm really grateful for that. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. Very well. So what are safety margins and factors of safety? You and I have likely used these terms in the past, but I would like to take a few moments to clarify what they mean, and that's the purpose of the video you're watching right now. A reminder that you've reached this video from the original lecture, which will be linked for you below in the description to this video. But before we get to the nitty gritty, let's touch on something a bit more fundamental, which is, what are safe structures? Well, the most fundamental requirement of a structure is that it should be safe. So that means that not only must a structure make you feel safe so that you can sleep at night, but that structure must also be safe because it's made up of the right material and right configuration and shape and size to support the loads put on it. So not only must it make people feel safe, it must also be strong enough. However, in order for a structure to be able to support the loads on it, we have to recognize that ensuring a safe structure is actually a balance. And it's a balance between some of the properties of the construction materials that are used to make that structure and the loads that that structure has to resist, right? So a structure is safe if that structure's strength is greater than the strength required to carry those loads. Let me say it slightly differently. As long as the strength of the structure is greater than the loads it has to support, we're okay, right? And that's where safety margins come into play. You see, Safety margins are defined as the ratio of the actual strength of the structure divided by the required strength to support those loads. So according to this definition, the safety margin must be greater than one, right? You always want a structure that is actually stronger than the loads it needs to support, right? That it can support more than what's put on it. Makes sense, right? Now. Let's take a moment to discuss a little bit about the variables that come into play in the safety of structures. As previously shown, and as you can see here on the screen, safety in a structure is a balance. And it's a balance between the properties of the construction materials that are used to build a structure and the loads applied to that structure. I'd like to remind you that the typical construction materials used in North America will deteriorate over time. That's a fundamental truth, okay? So although you build something out of a good material, that material will deteriorate. I'd also like to remind you that the expected load, pardon me, on a structure is also variable. That is, the loads on a structure that we come up with may vary in magnitude and location over time. And I'm thinking, for example, uh, about uh, occupancy loads as a good example of variable loads, right? So let's say people, students in a classroom, from hour to hour, day to day, the number and locations of the students in a classroom changes. Furthermore, I also want to point out that loads, uh, and I'm thinking occupant loads, but loads in general are difficult to properly estimate and approximate. Now, why do I bring this up? Why do I bring this up? Well, if we consider some of the common construction materials like concrete, as you see on the screen, or wood, it is important to point out that both of these material require high safety margins because their properties, that is the properties of concrete, the properties of wood, are reliant on so many factors which modify the performance of either concrete or wood from day to day, from batch to batch, right? weather, moisture, uh, workmanship, 
whatever, okay? However, so uh, basically safety margins, as long as they're high, that's great. But that's not reality, okay? Safety margins, large safety margin, high, huge safety margins are not economical, okay? And that's because it would result in very, very expensive structures, right? This is the third informal limit states that was discussed a number of topics ago. So how do structural engineers incorporate safety in structures and safety if, if safety margins is not the right way to go? Well, I'm gonna cover two methods of incorporating safety in structures as inspired by your textbook. And those are gonna be the allowable stress method and the load factor and resistance factors. Okay, so let's talk about the allowable stress method first. This method is on its way out and it's not really used anymore. It, I assure you it's not used in Canada, okay? In general terms, it's based on the concept that based on the applied load, you wanna limit the stress in the structure caused by the load applied to it to a value that is less than the structure's failure stress. Okay, this is a very fancy way of saying that the stress in the structure has to be less than the failure stress of the structure. Make sense? So that you're limiting the stresses in that structures only to what it can take. Okay? The stress in the structure is called the allowable stress. So that the ratio of the failure stress to the allowable stress is the safety margin. Just like this. Okay? It's also called the factor of safety. So if we do a quick example, just using this formula, where factor of safety is failure stress divided by allowable stress, let's say you are asked to calculate the allowable stress in some fictitious construction material. I don't know, let's call it unobtainium. And you're told that the failure stress of unobtainium is 2000, P 2000 PSI. And you're told to employ an allowable stress of two, sorry, uh, uh, a, a factor of safety of two. Then you can calculate the allowable stress of that material by rearranging the formula we just saw a few moments ago as follows, okay? Allowable stress, if that's what you're looking for, is failure stress divided by factor of safety. So that means 2000 PSI divided by two equals to 1000 PSI of allowable stress. Now again, this method, allowable stress, allowable stress design, it's on its way out. It's not even used in Canada, okay? But I wanted you to make, I wanted you to be aware of this because some still use it, okay? Let's get on to something that's a bit more realistic because this is the method that's used in Canada and most, mostly in the US as well. Load factors and resistance factors. This method is called limit states design in Canada. In the US, it's called load and resistance factor design, okay? Or LRFD for short. It is based, again, on the proper and realistic balance between the strength of construction materials and the estimation of the loads that you're putting on that structure, which we discussed a few moments ago earlier on in this video. So, what happens with load factors is that the structural engineer increases the value of the expected loads on the structure so that they're actually larger than the expected ones. Okay, so if you're assuming you're gonna get, I don't know, two feet of snow on a roof, you actually assume that it's more than that. You make the loads on the structure larger. So that means that typically then the load factors have to be greater than one. Now, if you want to refresh yourselves about various types of loads, I'm gonna link for you again the previous two topics that dealt with this. They're gonna be in the description below. Okay, so that's load factors. Load factors are used to make the loads on the structure larger than they actually are, okay? So you're assuming that you're gonna support way more than you expect. You combine that then with resistance factors which are then related to the construction material. They are used, resistance factors, to reduce the expected strength of the material used. 
And as such, they're typically less than zero. So again, what you're doing is you're making the loads on the structure bigger than they actually are, and you're making the strength of the structure less than it is. That's why resistance factors are typically less than one. And by balancing these two, you're gonna design a structure that is safe and feels safe. This is the method that's used by structural engineers in Canada. That's it. That's all I wanted to get to. We've reached the end of the presentation. I wanna thank you so much for your time. You've been lovely and take care.